All right. I am back. Continuing uh, uh, in a moment here with the uh, the piece written by the editorial board at the New York Times about Donald Trump is not above the law. Uh, this is becoming more and more important because the fact that he's not above the law or the fact that he should not be, it's becoming more and more important as the evidence becomes more and more evident, evident evidence, how's that, that what he has done in terms of uh, uh, taking these classified, these class, this classified material, what this monster has done and what he had planned to do, which I think is part of the investigation, with um, documents that he had no business seeing ever, not even when he was president, because he's a grifter, he's a liar, he's a punk. Um, that makes the entire investigation even more important. And the fact that um, this, uh, this warrant that was used to conduct this search has now been made public. And even though a lot of it has been uh, redacted, it, it is clear, at least it is to me, that the Justice Department had strong belief that what this bastard was trying to do involved criminal activity. The risks of political escalation, they're talking about whether or not to prosecute this rotten son of a bitch, Trump. The risks of political escalation are obvious. The Democratic and Republican parties are already in the thick of a cycle of retribution that could last generations. There is a substantial risk that if the Justice Department does prosecute Trump, future presidents, whether Mr. Trump himself or someone of his ilk, could misuse the precedent to punish political rivals. If their party takes the majority in the House of Representatives after the midterm elections, some Republicans have already threatened to impeach President Biden. There is even there is an even more immediate th- threat of future violence, and it is a possibility that Americans should sadly be prepared for. In the hours after federal agents began a court-approved search of Mr. Trump's residence at Palm Beach, based on a warrant investigating possible violations of three federal laws, including one that governs the handling of defense information under the Espionage Act, his most fervent supporters escalated their rhetoric to the language of warfare. As the Times noted at the time, quote, the aggressive widespread response was arguably the clearest outburst of violent public rhetoric since the days leading up to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. End quote. Mr. Merrick Garland has been deliberate, methodical and scrupulous in his leadership of the Justice Department's investigation of the January 6th attack and the transfer of documents to Mr. Trump's home. But no matter how careful he is or how measured the prosecution might be, there is a real and significant risk from those who believe that any criticism of Mr. Trump justifies an extreme response. Yet it is a far greater risk to do nothing when action is called for. Aside from letting Mr. Trump escape punishment, doing nothing to hold him accountable for his actions in the months leading up to the January 6th event could set an irresistible precedent for future presidents. Why not attempt to stay in power by any means necessary or use the power of the office to enrich oneself or punish one's enemies, knowing that the law does not apply to presidents in or out of office? More important... Democratic government is an ideal that must constantly be made real. America is not sustained by a set of principles. It is sustained by resolute action to defend those principles. Immediately after the January 6th insurrection, cabinet members reportedly debated privately whether to remove Mr. Trump from power under the authority of the 25th Amendment. A week after the attack... The House impeached Mr. Trump for the second time. This editorial board supported his impeachment and removal from office. We also suggested that the former president and lawmakers who participated in the January 6th plot could be permanently banned from holding office under a provision of the 14th Amendment 
that applies to any official who has, quote, engaged in insurrection or rebellion or given aid or comfort to those who have done so, end quote. But most Republicans in the Senate refuse to convict Mr. Trump, and Congress has yet to invoke that section of the 14th Amendment against him. As a result, the threat that Mr. Trump and his most ardent supporters pose to American democracy has metastasized. Even now, the former president continues to spread his lies about the 2020 election and denounce his vice president, Mike Pence, for not breaking the law on his behalf. And meanwhile, dozens of people who believe Mr. Trump's lies are running for state and national elected office. Many have already won. Some of them elevated to positions that give them control over how elections are conducted. In June, the Republican Party in Texas approved measures in its platform declaring that Mr. Biden's election was illegitimate. And Mr. Trump appears prepared to start a bid for a second term as president. Mr. Trump's actions as a public official, like no other since the Civil War, attacked the heart of our system of government. He used the power of his office to subvert the rule of law. If we hesitate to call those actions and their perpetrator criminal, then we are saying he is above the law and we are giving license to future presidents to do whatever they want. In addition to a federal investigation by the Justice Department, Mr. Trump is facing a swirl of criminal and civil liability in several other cases. A lawsuit by the Attorney General for the District of Columbia over payments during his inauguration ceremonies. A criminal investigation in Westchester County, New York over taxes on one of his golf courses. A criminal case in Fulton County, Georgia over interference in the 2020 election. A criminal case by the Manhattan District Attorney over the valuation of Mr. Trump's properties. And a civil inquiry by New York's Attorney General into Mr. Trump and the Trump Organization. The specific crimes the Justice Department could consider would likely involve Mr. Trump's fraudulent efforts to get election officials in Georgia, Arizona, and elsewhere to declare him the winner, even though he lost their states. And to get Mr. Pence, at the January 6th congressional certification of the election, to throw out slates of electors from states he lost and replace them with loyal electors to Mr. Trump, and to enlist officials from the Department of Justice, Homeland Security, and Department of Defense to persuade officials in certain states to swing the election to him and ultimately stir up a mob that attacked the Capitol. The government could also charge Mr. Trump with seditious conspiracy, a serious charge that federal prosecutors have already brought against leaders of far-right militia groups who participated in the Capitol invasion. The committee hearings make it clear Mr. Trump must have known he was at the center of a frantic, sprawling, and knowingly fraudulent effort that led directly to the Capitol siege. For hours, Mr. Trump refused to call up the mob. The testimony from hundreds of witnesses, many of them high-ranking Republican officials from his own administration, reveals Mr. Trump's unrelenting efforts beginning months before Election Day and continuing through January 6th to sow doubts about the election, to refuse to accept the result of that election, and then to pursue what he must have known were illegal and unconstitutional means to overturn it. Many participants sought preemptive pardons for their conduct, an indication they knew they were violating the law. Other evidence points to other crimes, like obstruction of Congress, defined as a corrupt obstruction of the proper administration of the law. The fake elector scheme that Mr. Trump and his associates pushed before January 6th appears to meet this definition. That may explain why at least three of Mr. Trump's campaign lawyers were unwilling to participate in the plot. People involved in it were told it was not legally sound 
by White House lawyers, but they moved forward with it anyway. Cassidy Hutchinson, a top aide to Mr. Trump's last chief of staff, Mark Meadows, provided powerful evidence that could be used to charge Mr. Trump with seditious conspiracy. In her public testimony at a January 6th committee hearing, she said that Mr. Trump was informed that many in the throng of supporters waiting to hear him speak on the ellipse that day were armed, but that he demanded they be allowed to skip the metal detectors that had been installed for his security. He said, according to Ms. Hutchinson, quote, they're not here to hurt me. Let my people in. They can march to the Capitol from here. End quote. If Mr. Garland decides to pursue prosecution, a message that the Justice Department must send early and often is that even if Mr. Trump genuinely believed, as he claimed, that the election had been marred by fraud, his schemes to interfere in the certification of the vote would still be crimes. And even though Mr. Trump's efforts failed, these efforts would still be crimes. More than 850 other Americans have already been charged with crimes for their roles in the Capitol attack. Well-meaning intentions did not shield them from the consequences of their actions. It would be unjust if Mr. Trump, the man who inspired them, faced no consequences. No one should revel in the prospect of this or any former president facing criminal prosecution. Mr. Trump's actions have brought shame on one of the world's oldest democracies and has destabilized its future. Even justice before the law will not erase that stain, nor will prosecuting Mr. Trump fix the structural problems that led to the greatest crisis in American democracy since the Civil War. But it is a necessary first step toward doing so. And that is the uh, essay put together by the editorial board of the New York Times regarding Trump is not above the law. And he has to be prosecuted. I I, I mean, I fully understand, and, and so do you at this point, that these punk bastards, these little cowardly shits who run around the country with their little phony military uniforms and their big guns, you know, threatening people and acting as if they were men. We, we know what they will do, probably. Although I sometimes have my doubts because to the last one of these son of a bitches, whether they're the three percenters or the um, uh, proud boys or, or proud pricks, whatever they are, oath keepers, every single one of them is a goddamn cowardly little shit who when on his own, as so many of them have done, when they've been hauled before the bar of justice after the January 6th attack on the Capitol, almost every one of these little bastards have said, oh, well, I really regret what I did. No, I don't believe that stuff. Please, please, Your Honor, I've got a family. Don't put me in jail. But when gathered together as a mob, all of a sudden, don't they have a lot of courage? Huh? Son of a bitches. Hi, Truth Seekers. Mike Malloy here. As you know, we've switched formats and are now broadcast exclusively on the Progressive Voices Network. So that means you get fewer program interruptions, no corporate commercials, and lots of profanity. But our format change also means some of our radio listeners no longer hear the program. It's been a while since I mentioned our podcasts, so you may have forgotten that there is a way to listen to this program anytime you need a good dose of screaming. Visit MikeMalloy.com and subscribe to our podcast. As a podcast subscriber, you can download the program to your mobile device and take me with you wherever you go. And if you have a friend who needs a dose of truth-seeking, you can give a gift subscription as well. That's MikeMalloy.com and never miss a minute of the uncensored fun and frivolity.